Hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. Hi everyone, Nick Skillicorn from Improvides here with a very, very, very special interview. Um, I'm here today with Professor Vincent Walsh from University College London. And uh, Professor Walsh is one of my inspirations when it comes to actually understanding the neuroscience behind creativity and how the brain generates ideas. So, thank you, uh, Professor Walsh. Shall I call you Vincent? Or? Yeah, Vincent is fine, whichever. Okay. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk to us about uh, University College London and what they do as far as neuroscience and understanding the brain and creativity goes? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, in terms of neuroscience, well, we're here in Queen's Square, which is the uh, neuroscience hub of, of the whole of the UK, and I would argue of, of Europe. Um, hundreds of world-class researchers in this, this square, in this institute, Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, without doubt the leading institute in Europe. Uh, there's about 140 of us who investigate um, uh, memory, uh, perception, um, um, depression, brain stimulation, um, um, s sleep and the effects of sleep on, on cognition, anything that you can think of related to our, our cognitive abilities. Now, uh, one of the reasons I was so excited to meet you is I saw one of your lectures a while back about how the brain generates ideas and especially the different brain states within which different aspects of ideas form. So, uh, could you tell us a bit about um, whether or not there's actually any truth to the idea that a subconscious brain is doing anything to generate ideas? Yeah. Um, j just for snobbish reasons, I'm not keen on the word, on, on saying subconscious brain, but I think everybody understands what you mean by it. Um, and really, I think one thing that's worth emphasizing and perhaps regaining in, in, in psychology and neuroscience is that the vast majority of the brain is, brain activity is, is um, behind the wall from us. It is unconscious to us. Uh, we're very impressed by our language, our cleverness, our problem-solving ability, and we get all excited when people say they have a solution to consciousness. But it's you know, less than a percent of our brain activity that we become aware of. Right now, your brain is your brain is is regulating your 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 breathing. Right now, your brain is uh, is dealing with your state of, of tiredness. Right now, it's dealing with your mood. Right now, it's dealing with all the things that you. Um, that you think you've forgotten about, but actually it's still working on, on putting them all together. Um, so that old kind of question, do, do, is it true that we use only 10% um, of our brains? I think it, part, of the, uh, part of not the truth of that, but part of the reason that it's ironic is that we're really aware of much less than 10% of our brain activity oh. at any one time. Um, so really what we should be impressed by is what our brain is doing that we are not aware of rather than the stuff that we're aware of and that provides the link to creativity for me. So it's not just heartbeat and breathing and body functions uh, what's going on offline in the brain that actually helps you form ideas? So oh gosh so many things um, so right now we're both tied up thinking about about our next sentence or our, our next idea and that means that that lots of our brain systems are tied up, uh, connections that have been uh, on this job before are now talking to each other. Those uh, brain cells in those connections, those networks, are now no longer available uh, for other kinds of thinking. So what we really need to do to have new thoughts, good new thoughts and insights is to liberate um, uh, the brain from all those, those workaday tasks and let it operate offline. And this is why if you really think about when people have ideas, they have ideas when they're not thinking about them. You know? Yeah, it, it always happens yeah. when you're at least expecting it. Yeah, and, um, and that's because that 1% or less of the brain that you're aware of brain activity um, is, is really not important in the ideas generation. It's the 90 odd percent that's offline, that's behind the wall, that you're not aware of. Uh, that's important for ideas generation. So that's why daydreaming is a good idea, afternoon naps is a good idea, um, uh, sleep is a great time for putting I ideas together. Um, and I think it's also one of the reasons why in the modern world um, we find ourselves doing too much and doing too much ordinary stuff. Um, there's a great history of not just people but of institutions giving people, giving either themselves or the people who work for them, 
time, downtime to do nothing, to explore new things. Um, and that's when you get your great ideas. The, the workaholic doesn't come up with, with great ideas. Is there, is there a sort of link between today's world where people are constantly checking their email and checking their Facebook status and people just seem to be more anxious that if they disconnect from being constantly inundated with information? So I'm not, I'm not so sure. I, uh, um, um, I, I'm certainly not f afraid of what technology is doing to our, our brains because um, it doesn't change as much as we, as we like to think. That's a good, good news. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you think of, uh, let's go back to a, a completely pre-technological time, how big a human group would be, you probably have around about 120 to 150 yeah. close contacts. If you now look at, um, at people's behaviour on Facebook, even if they've got thousands of friends, really the core of it is around about 120 to 250 people yeah. who they check and interact with. So our, our social capacity hasn't really, uh, really increased and the way we interact with, uh, with people hasn't really changed that much and it's a, a little bit like uh, the brain activity that we're aware of and the real stuff that goes on we're aware of these um, uh, this this pattern of differences from, from how things were 30 years ago but really um, um, the the core of it isn't isn't that different so I, I don't think that that being switched on um, electronically all the time is a bad idea I actually think it might be a good idea because when you are so-called switched on to Twitter and to Facebook and to whatever else rubbish that is not taking up any brain, any real brain space, um, it might be the equivalent of zoning out and staring at the wallpaper. You know, it might be the equivalent of taking a drive that you you've done a thousand times and you know, so you can actually think of other things on that that drive. I'm, I'm not sure that this. Um, fast response world is as dangerous as we as we like to think. Having said that, <laughs> I, 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 have, I, do, I do switch off my email alerts. <laughs> I, I try to as well, but it's, it's quite tough. Um, so we've, we've heard that there's links between sleep and mm -hmm. stress levels and everything. It sounds a bit uh, theoretical at the moment. Um, have, you, have you seen any experiments either from your sure. teams? It's not theoretical at all. Um, 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 depending on, on how wedded you are to the view that life is a randomised controlled trial, you could call the first examples I'll give you either um, uh, anecdotal or uh, single case studies, but there is a long history of people um, coming up with ideas when they were zoning out, just daydreaming, thinking of nothing, of that problem that they've been working on for months, uh, the answer or part of the answer comes to them. There's a long history of people dreaming about the solutions to problems. There's a lot a long history of people sleeping, waking up and then thinking, ah, I know that I've got the, the answer in there, it's, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue, and then they, the, the answer emerges following these downtimes, yeah. zoning out, lots of alpha waves, downtime in sleep, lots of different frequency activity. So let's call that anecdotal or case study, whichever you yeah. wish. But then <coughs> on the experimental side, there's a great deal of evidence um, that being in uh, in these down states, when your your brain is operating at certain frequencies called oscillatory states, um, that these are really good precursors to uh, having ideas. Um, and <coughs> in waking states, it's pretty much well established, I think, that being in a an, an alpha state is a good precursor to being able to solve a problem or have an idea. And uh, for <coughs> our uh, viewers who aren't as yeah. scientific, alpha state is relaxed, sleepy, so the, in the shower, yeah, uh, or or you know, in a in, in a lecture you don't want to be in you <laughs> zone out, okay, uh, right, you, you zone into the distance, yeah, um, uh, or a TV program you're not really paying attention to. Okay. that's when you're you know when your focus isn't on the direct, <coughs> yeah, uh, when you're thing da daydreaming, would be yeah, a good alpha state, a reverie, okay, um, and. The third line of evidence is in sleep, and uh, there's a, a lot of evidence now that that either a, a nap, up to 90 minutes of a nap, or a full night's sleep will improve your your memory, your ability to associate things that you've learned about during the day, and also your ability to problem solve and make make links between things. So um, it's not theoretical, uh, and 
I think should be taken seriously if you consider yourself a serious ideas generator, uh, but you were also to tell me that you work 80 hours a week, I'd say something is wrong there. You know, yeah. Because sometimes the, the way to be creative and the, the smartest thing you can do is to do nothing. So to take an afternoon nap or to, um, or, or to get into to good sleep habits, to not be afraid of doing nothing. And I think, to go back to your being switched on electronically point, perhaps the, um, uh, the um, worst thing about, um, uh, about being switched on to the electronic world all the time is it feeds this idea that we have to be doing something all the time. And as far as your brain is concerned, doing nothing isn't doing nothing. It's when the brain can you know, really go to work. Yeah. So let's take it a step further then and talk about enhancing people's creativity, uh, either through exercises or specifically, hopefully you can tell us a bit about uh, the neuroscience and whether or not there's any ways that you can turn on parts of the brain or shut off parts of the brain that actually does something to help someone generate an idea. Yeah. And I know there's some research in something called transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, uh, is this some work that you guys do? And So I, I, I use forms of, of brain stimulation, but when it comes to the claims in the literature that you can unlock people's creative potential, it's, it's really bullshit. Um, <laughs> and it's not just... Damn it! <laughs> it's not just bullshit. It's, um, it's philosophically a bad habit to get into, to thinking that we can unlock. I, I find that <coughs> quite fascinating because, especially when you're mentioning people working 80 hours a week, uh, quite often these people consider themselves to be the, the leaders and managers uh, of teams of people, which is why they have so much to do. And these people need to be figuring out what's, what's prioritized and what's important, but also where the team needs to go, and that requires the generation of ideas. And in a lot of corporate settings, the way that teams say, we need to come up with an, uh, an idea or a couple of ideas, let's do a brainstorming session. So let's get all of our creativity into a, a two-hour period. Um, sometimes people come up with a large number of ideas, but uh, quite often the ideas don't seem to actually go anywhere. Is that linked with this idea of downtime and frequency? It's linked with something else, which is a, a very long and well-established literature in psychology that getting groups of people together is no way to come up with an idea. Creativity is not a team sport. Um, what you're looking for is um, is somebody's individual intellectual um, um, track to, um, uh, to 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 make new connections and to come up with something new. Now, let's imagine um, let's imagine uh, the billions of neurons in my head communicating with stuff that they've been talking about all their lives together. Uh, there's a, a high probability that occasionally they'll come up with something new. Let's now think of the line of communication you and I have got between each other, which is impoverished because uh, we have to try and translate complex ideas into language. And how many times do you find that you've got a good idea, it's almost in symbolic thought in your head, and you really can't articulate it to somebody too um, often. And when you do, um, they get the wrong I idea because you really language can't encapsulate it until it's it's fully formed. Um, but there's no good evidence uh, that I uh, I know of that that th these brainstorming um, sessions will come up with a solution or a new idea. What they might do is improve a little bit of team spirit, or uh, they might show some of the people in the group that will actually if that's the best they can come up with, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, so it might motivate me to think a little bit harder. But um, the idea that you can marshal uh, creativity is, um, uh, is, is, is an error. And I would go a little bit further, and if there is um, somebody who is spending 80 hours a week running a creative team, um, I would stop them right there and say, running a creative team. You don't run a creative. You allow a creative team to run. Yeah. Uh, that would be the first different uh, thing I, I, I would I, I would jump on. Um, and people should really ask themselves, you know, how, how how can I make people be creative? You can't. You allow people to be 
be creative. A lot of people um, do, however, find it very uncomfortable when they're asked to generate new ideas. Yeah. And does that essentially mean if brainstorming as a concept yeah. is flawed to come up with lots of ideas, should you just ignore the people who feel uncomfortable being creative, or is there some something you can do to help not, them? They might not feel uncomfortable being creative. They might feel uncomfortable uh, uh, um, 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 describing it or, or articulating it in a, in a certain forum. Um, you know, some people are better to write their ideas down, some people are, are better to present their ideas to a, a small team, some people like to grandstand with their, their ideas, uh, that's part of the Classic management. Classic extrovert versus introvert. Yeah, find out how it is that people want to, um, uh, want to, to articulate what it is that they know. Um, but I do think it's, it's a good idea to get people to, um, to articulate, present ideas. In, uh, in a public forum. This is different from brainstorming where everybody's meant to put something in. Uh, and one recommendation I have, and I've, I, 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 I try it from time to time, is to have trashing sessions. So we live in this cotton wool world where, and especially at, at, the, uh, in, at the higher levels of, 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 of business or any, any, any level of a, any industry of achievement, um, people ha have not been told that they are wrong for a long time, hmm. you know, and our whole education system is geared to telling people what they're good at, and actually the people who are most successful and come up with the best ideas are the people who also fail the most and come up with the dumbest ideas. Uh, and one and of the, the ones who are willing to do that. Yeah, but, but I think it's it's not hard to engender a culture of, of failure. Um, and it's not I think, well, uh, I think for, for us it may seem like that, but if you look at the evidence, the schooling system and yeah. universities and workplaces, they, they are built to teach people to think that giving the right answer is what's required yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and really interesting questions haven't got simple right answers. Uh, sometimes, yeah. sometimes the creative part is identifying the question, not identifying the answer. But I, I think we should really relearn to embrace failure. So here's how a trashing session would, work, would run. You would come in, present to a group of us your idea for 15 minutes. We then have 30 minutes to discuss your idea. The only function of us as a group of listeners to you is to tell you why your idea is wrong, ill-conceived, um, uneconomical, um, um, why it won't work, uh, why it will take too much time even if it does work, and uh, uh, to take your idea down, not to ask the questions that people um, always ask in meetings. Well, have you thought of the cost of it? That's yeah. a way of saying what's the market? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, what's the value in 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 trashing your 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 talk like that? Well, first of all, it liberates the audience. Um, the rules are that we don't have to say things we believe in order to take your talk down. We can say anything, so we can say things that we can take back. Rule okay. number two is that that what goes on in a trashing session stays in a trashing session. You're not allowed afterwards to say, "Did you really mean what you said in there, Vince, about my whole career?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and we, the rule number three is we're not allowed to check upon whether you do anything with that information in that trashing session. Okay. Um, but it puts people in a position where they are allowed to be wrong, completely wrong, and where uh, the people in the audience are allowed to be super openly critical. And the opportunities we get for that kind of gloves off approach um, are basically zero, you know, family rows, you know, that's the only place you can take, say things that you can really take back. Uh, and, I, and I think we need to em embrace this uh, kind of culture instead of bringing our ego with us to every interaction where we have to protect what it is that we it's one of the reasons that I don't like the idea of of students recording uh, lectures or every lecture you do public lecture or private lecture being recorded now because the idea is that it's an intellectual exchange that allows you to learn and you can't learn without making mistakes um, and I, I, I think it's one of the biggest barriers to to um, not just creativity with results, but even that sense of personal creative exploration. Well, Vincent, that's really been eye-opening on a number of levels, so thank you very much for You're joining welcome. me today. Thank you. Nice Cheers. To meet you.